Welcome to 1963 of Soviet Space Program. Early commercial applications is still active, with all program requirements completed. As this only takes a single program slot, there is no other choice available to replace with a newer and better paying program. For that reason, we will keep this one a while longer to continue building confidence. Early Interplanet Probes is heading into a flat funding segment of the program with four years remaining. The Marsnik probes are still in transit to the Red Planet, but we will be aiming to complete the final contracts during the second half of the year. Advanced Crewed Orbit is almost halfway through the program timeframe, with just the rendezvous contract completed. Facility upgrades are still in progress, and some research still needs to be unlocked before the first EVA and dockings can be performed. Lastly, uncrewed lunar surface exploration is one year in with no progress. But once the Cosmonaut Complex upgrade is completed, we will change focus to sending the first object to land on the moon. Getting the Cosmonaut Complex upgrade completed is the current priority, as it is holding up any further progress with human spaceflight. Running at 100% construction rate, this is causing a minor funding deficit requiring to dip into the reserves as the weeks and months roll by. Though by the end of March, we return to a positive income and then finally complete construction on May 13th. It's time to increase the cosmonaut pool as we head into training for the Voskhod program. Our next applicants to come on board are Alexei Kamenskik, who is an engineer, as well as Angelika Formanova, a scientist. The proficiency training for this group will take 190 days and complete at the end of November. With money rolling back in, we now return to building and launching more rockets. June 18th is a Cosmos 1 flying a commercial payload of 230 units. As mentioned in the previous episode, the crewed lunar program is the next major step for the space agency and will need to be taken at either fast or breakneck in order to be able to land on the moon before the end of the decade. The Cosmos 1 is a cheap rocket to launch for these contracts, so these will continue to fly until we can finally take on crewed lunar. July 26th marks the return to the moon, as Luna 5 takes flight on the Vostok L. It has been four years since the last Luna mission, and the goal for this one is to successfully land on the surface and transmit back science. We don't know what the conditions are like on the moon, so by sending a probe, we can obtain imaging data to determine what to expect when we eventually send cosmonauts to the lunar surface. Luna 5 executes a translunar injection with an impact trajectory, and then a braking maneuver is plotted to determine how to orient the lander for the coast phase to the moon. This mission did not have the mass budget to include a guided braking stage. So similar to the last lunar orbiter, Luna 5 is oriented to the maneuver and spun up for stabilization. Luna 5 will coast in a hibernated state for almost three days, as the lander is battery operated. But once it is within half an hour from impact, the avionics will be awoken as they will be required once the braking stages are jettisoned. With a calculated impact time of T-1 minute, the braking stage is ulliged, and the twin U-2000s light to begin slowing down the craft. The timing is important, as there is a narrow altitude limit where the final stage will be able to de-spin and slow down enough to safely land. The process is repeated with the second braking stage, and the single U-2000 fires for an additional 28 seconds. The stage depletes, leaving the lander at 15 kilometers from the surface to begin the despin and reorient for landing. Then, at 7 kilometers, the engines fire for the final landing sequence to the surface. As seconds go by, things begin to look grim, as it seems the landing burn may have started too early and will not have enough to safely touch down. By some miracle, 
Luna 5 contacts the surface just as the propellants deplete. Excitement fills mission control, as telemetry and scientific readings indicate a safe landing on the surface. Over the course of the next several hours, the first images of the lunar surface will be transmitted back, revealing details that orbiters would not be able to capture. After the last of the data is transmitted, Luna 5's mission reaches an end, as the batteries reach depletion 22 hours after touchdown. The reward of 250 applicants from the first lunar landing quickly gets put to use, with 150 of those hired as researchers. The remaining 100 will be left alone for the moment, as budget is too constrained. August 17th, Marsnik-1 awakes from hibernation as it approaches the red planet. The signal strength back to Earth is beginning to diminish, with only having connection to a single ground station at Yevpatoria. This means there are daily signal blackout periods, only allowing connection during a 10-hour window per day. Thankfully for this mission, this connection window will be during the time Marsnik-1 is executing the capture. The notification has come through that we have succeeded with the Mars flyby contract. Then, Marsnik-1 exits its sun tracking mode and prepares for the capture maneuver. At an altitude near 300 kilometers, the engine ignites and begins breaking the probe into an elliptical orbit. A successful capture, marking another major milestone with our second closest celestial neighbor. The notifications come in confirming the success of the orbit contract, as well as indicating the completion of the Interplanetary Probes program. Four days later, Marsnik 2 is ready to repeat a similar process as it nears the red planet. The primary mission of Marsnik 2 was to act as a backup in the event that Marsnik 1 failed to capture into orbit. But with the success of the first probe, there is less stress if this were to fail, and it would just be icing on the cake if it succeeds. The communication window this time is not as convenient, as it will be in a blackout period when the capture is to be performed. For this reason, the command needs to be executed 14 and a half hours prior to the maneuver. The teams back at home will be in the blind until the following day when they re-establish connection, but we will be able to watch it as it executes the capture in real time. Another successful capture, and Marsnik 2 becomes the second man-made object to be placed around Mars. The signs from this probe will continue to help the agency by trickling in more confidence as well as allowing to unlock more research in R&D. This will be our last look at Mars until the 1970s, as the focus now will be switched back to our own moon. We return to the Space Center, as program funding has now increased enough to hire more applicants. Of the 200 remaining, 150 are hired as researchers and then we head into R&D for a spending spree. With 452 science, we invest in various nodes to prepare for sending crew to the moon, including lunar orbiter capsules, lunar rated heat shields, various engine tech nodes, early life support, lunar exploration era material science, as well as docking and crew transfer. In September, we return to more commercial satellite launches, this time with the Cosmos 1 Block 2. Discerning individuals might notice a slight difference compared to previous launches, and that is because this now uses a different engine setup for the upper stages. The RD-119s are replaced with the S-1-5400, allowing for engine restarts without a 90-minute time restriction. Although this changeout reduces the overall performance, this increases its capability, as the upper stage can now be used for insertions into final payload orbits. 
coupled with multi-layer insulation, hydrogen boil-off is mostly mitigated, only incurring minor losses after loitering in orbit for multiple hours. The starting reliability of these engines have a mean time between failures of one hour, so fitting them on this smaller rocket will help build flight data while minimizing the risk compared to larger rockets. We have a second launch on the same day, as another lunar lander lifts off. Taking the learnings from the previous mission, Luna 6 incorporates refined aluminum stringer tanks, providing increased performance for the braking and landing stages. The first mission experienced a close call, so these upgrades hope to resolve that. The target for this launch is Mare Imbrium, as we want to explore new biomes to gather more science and learn about the different surface features of the moon. The same process is followed as before, with spin stabilization of the lander and ignition of the braking stage within T-60 seconds to impact. We soon find out that this sequence should have been delayed a few seconds as the lander is still 60 kilometers above the surface when the first stage burns out. Minor delay is incorporated to allow the lander to lose some altitude before initiating the second braking stage. But this delay proves to not be enough, as the stage terminates 24 kilometers above the surface. The probability of landing has now been reduced due to the increased starting altitude but we learned from the last mission that the landing burn can be delayed a few seconds compared to the MechJab readout. Delaying by 4 seconds seems to help, but as time passes by, we see that the margins are not going to be enough. With 15 meters from the surface, the propellant depletes, and Luna 6 impacts the lunar surface, tumbling onto its side. I guess we can still call this a success, as the avionics and antenna are still operational, and we are transmitting the data back to mission control. The photo quality may not be as good as the previous mission, but we can hope that the transmission is not intercepted and leaked to the rest of the world. Returning to the Space Center, the remaining 50 applicants are hired as researchers, and then we head into the VAB to prepare for the Voskhod rocket. For the Voskhod upgrade, the upper stage now incorporates the RD-0107, with the near-Earth avionics set to 40 tons. The avionics for the core are also upgraded to support 325 tons, which should future-proof it all the way through to the Soyuz program. The LC is set to 325 tons with a height of 40 meters, and then we initiate the 20-day modification. By the 22nd of November, the group of cosmonauts complete their proficiency training, and we can now begin mission training for the first Voskhod flight. Alexei and Angelka are selected, but with a 65-day training period, we will have to wait until January to launch. We do, however, have one final flight of the year with a Cosmos 1 Block 2. This launch is a departure from the typical launches, as it has a rideshare carrying a scientific satellite alongside the commercial payload. Several new experiments unlocked earlier this year when interplanetary science was completed, so it is a good opportunity to begin gathering more science in low Earth space. Payloads get deployed in a final 9,000 by 1,500 kilometer orbit, marking the final task of the year. Thanks for watching, and see you in 1964.